Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I am Mick Alphanim. So we're going to begin right here. This is on CryptoNewsFlash.com. All right, I'm just going to read the article here. This is a little tidbit. Remember, they're saying this, not me. All right, <laughs> even though we've heard Volante Tech say similar things about the importance of ISO 20022. This is what they're saying, not Alphanim. All right, here. This article is titled, Ripple, IOTA, and Stellar Lumens could work with SWIFT under ISO 20022 regulations. This is what they're saying, uh, written by John Kumi, released yesterday. So let's scroll down here. It says, Ripple, IOTA, and Stellar Lumen are reportedly in line to work with SWIFT under the ISO 20022 regulation. ISO is a single standardization approach meant uh, to use to be used by all financial standards initiatives. In other words, it enables interoperability between market structures, financial institutions, and banks' customers. SWIFT has announced that, that customers would be at different stages of their ISO adoption journey from March 2023 to November 2025. In addition to SWIFT, market infrastructures such as the Clearinghouse, the Federal Reserve, Bank of England and Nigeria Interbank Settlement System, NIBSS, have all declared their plans to migrate to ISO 20022. There was another company we covered also that was talking about the importance of ISO. I can't remember which one, but you all probably know it, probably screenshotted that. Um, it was in one of our recent videos. Ripple announced that it has become a part of the standard body in May 2020, distributed ledger technologies could reduce the cost of transactions that we know. Now, this is an interesting part here. Ripple has a technical edge over Swift. All right. Now, let's see what they're saying here. Uh, several factors, including unstructured data, demanding several manual inter interventions and closed networks have largely affected the objectives of cross-border payments to cut down costs, protect customer data, and provide cost-effective and fast payment services for customers. Because most SWIFT member institutions have core banking infrastructures built on multiple legacy systems, changing their operation to meet the new payment standards has become costly. For Ripple, its RippleNet platform is already compatible with cross-border payments and enables users to instantly access their money. Whoever wrote this, I like how you think. You, you're very thorough. Good job. In addition to lower costs, transactions are settled in as little as four seconds that we know. It is argued that DLT companies such as Ripple have an edge, which means Stellar as well, which means Algorand as well. It says DLT companies such as Ripple have an edge as their technological innovation already addresses the challenges of cost and speed. We're going to dominate. That's pretty much what they're saying here. We have the edge. Now, as I had postulated before, Swift has uh, countless thousands of banks. We can take at least a modicum of those banks. We can go from hundreds of banks to thousands. I think that's logical. Why would they not? Why would Ripple not want to do that? Why would Algorand not want to do that? I think that they do have those aspirations, right? All of the money and such, at least taking as much as you can. Then what does it do to the price of XRP if that happens? On-demand liquidity, of course, they've been making a huge push. So ask yourself, why would they stop pushing on-demand liquidity? They would not. They would not. It would only grow and expand over time. So with this and knowing we have the edge, and I've been saying that for quite some time, didn't I? I said that we were uh, adv more advanced than they are and all of their little CBD systems that lack interoperability. Now you find out, you see, you see here, they clarify. They are built on multiple legacy system platforms. So it's not going to be easy for them, right? This is why they're still running tests. They're sort of stuck in the mud, but... Let's continue on to another article here, all right? Appreciate every single one of you being here today. I uh, hope you all, you all had a good weekend. This is from coinedition.com, and it's titled, XRP's quote, investment contract status, 
attorney Hogan's legal analysis on Twitter. So it's here in the recent Twitter thread, attorney Jeremy Hogan shared what he believes to be the number one reason why XRP, a popular cryptocurrency, is not considered a security. According to Hogan, the, the legislative definition of security only allows XRP to be to fit under the category of an quote investment contract. Here it is. Here's his tweet. The number one reason why XRP is not a security a threat. First, under the legislative definition of security, XRP can only possibly fit under the definition of and quote investment contract. It is not a stock or bond, etc. Even the SEC concedes this quote investment contract. Then he has like a there's a blurb here. Section 2A1 of Securities Act 1933. Quote any note, stock, treasury stock, security, future, security based swap, bond, debenture, evidence of indebtedness, certificate of interest, or participation in any profit sharing agreement, collateral trust certificate, pre-organization certificate or subscription, transferable share, investment contract, voting trust certificate, certificate of deposit, it goes on and on, my word. It says, this means that XRP cannot be classified as a stock or bond. Hogan further hi highlighted that even the SEC has acknowledged this by referring to XRP as an, quote, investment contract, which is not. In a follow up to the previous Twitter thread, attorney Jeremy Hogan has shared additional insights into the analysis of XRP as an investment contract. Hogan explains that the Howey test uh, case, I mean, the, the Howey case and its subsequent cases govern the analysis of an investment contract. The, quote, test in the case, which requires an investment uh, in a common enterprise with the expectation of profits from the efforts of others was in response to a lower court opinion that deemed a speculative investment as necessary. According to Hogan, this legal framework is crucial in determining whether XRP should be classified as a, as a security or not. Attorney Jeremy Hogan has continued in his Twitter thread providing further analysis on the quote investment contract analysis for XRP. Hogan explains that while the Howey case did not focus on the quote contract element of the test, it was already established that a contract was necessary. Hogan references the Joyner case in which the court had discussed the existence of an enforceable implied or explicit agreement between the offerer and purchaser and quote investment contract. In contrast, Hogan notes that in the Ripple case, the SEC has not argued for the existence of an implied or explicit contract of investment. All right, so I'm gonna leave that there. Uh, listen, what Jeremy Hogan is saying sounds very similar to what Harvard Law said. They released two documents explaining this quite thoroughly. So now we have an article here on U.Today and it's titled, Ripple CTO compares XRP to coconut. Here's why it's important. It's important, important analogy. All right. <laughs> that just sounds funny. <laughs> All right. It says here, uh, Schwartz believes that instead of making dApps and other products working only with XRP, unless we are talking about an XRPL feature, developers should make the choice of assets to work with as wide as possible. Here's how the Ripple CTO puts it, quote, no, it should work with anything it can be made to work with, unquote. The reason named by Schwartz for, for this stance is that products made to work only with XRP may lose people's interest in the future. But he and Ripple want XRP to work for as many people as possible. Interesting wording. It says here, many times I get asked whether something should be made to only work with the XRP, unless it's an XRPL feature, where XRP really is special because it's the only native asset. I almost always say, no, it should work with anything it can be made to work with. Here's why a wide range of integrated assets is important. Now, he says, there are a lot of platforms and products that do not integrate XRP and when slash if they decide to switch into it, they will have a hard time. This is why, according to Swartz, a product should be able to work with a variety of crypto assets so that when necessary, it can easily add XRP token to the ecosystem. OK, we're going to stop there. He goes into the coconut aspect also in the next section. But if you want to read that, that's on you dot today. All right. It's right on the front page. So now let's move on to another article here. 
So of course, one of our banks is the Bank of England. Um, this article is from coindesk.com and it's titled, Bank of England targets 30 strong team for digital currency report. It says among the positions available, digital pound security architect and digital pound solutions architect. So they are getting very serious. They're moving forward with their CBDC development and testing. Um, obviously they're getting a lot of advice. I think um, Ripple was on two advisory boards. There was something that happened earlier this year. I can't remember exactly, but I think the Bank of England reached out to Ripple for advice on the CBDC, something like that. You can look that up for yourself. You don't have to just take my word for it. The Bank of England is looking to build a team of as many as 30 people to develop a central bank digital currency. The Sunday Times reported without saying where it got the figure. In February, the UK Central Bank and Finance Ministry said they were starting further research and development on a digital version of the pound sterling and invited the public to weigh in on the plans. While the project has been dubbed Britcoin, okay, in the press, the bank is less keen on the moniker, saying no decision has been made on whether a digital pound would use distributed ledger technology. If not, you're going to be uh, uh, very limited. Your interoperability is going to be very limited. Um, yesterday's article, that, that uh, video, where I addressed a lot of what the ECB was saying when the ECB, ECB said that uh, they didn't want to be relying on a foreign currency, I exposed that to show that it's not about being reliant on a foreign currency, you know, they use China as an example, but then I show like you get most of your products and all of these different things from China and the BRICS nation. So it can't be possibly that. Uh, what it is, is that you need to issue a CBDC for interoperability. So that money can flow into you, the, the central banks, into the commercial banks that are under your supervision. That's why you have to issue a CBDC, even though you were stand standoffish at different times. That was the point of that video. That was the point of that, 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 uh, that, uh, those segments, those, those chapters. Um, so, and, and yes, they do want control. That was the shocking part is that they just came right out and they're just saying it right now. Even though they denied it even up to two to three months ago, you had, I believe it was Fabio Panetta, don't quote me on that, I believe it was Fabio Panetta of the ECB saying that, hey, we don't even wanna use smart contracts. We're not looking to utilize these control mechanisms. And yet, yes, you have them confirming it now that they want to use utilize it for control. So that was the shocking aspect that they're being so bold to say these things, they don't care anymore. Um, so yes, they're going to have to, Bank of England as well, um, they're going to have to utilize distributed ledger technologies if they want a piece of that capital flowing into them. If they want to interact with people across the world, it's the only way. They lack interoperability otherwise. That's why they're still running tests trying to figure it all out. And they can't. We have the systems ready to deploy, which means uh, at some point in the future, who knows when, I don't have a date, I'm not in charge, the banks are in charge of this, the government, the, the blockchain companies, they are in charge of the timelines as far as when they want to, want to roll things out. I simply research and report the things that I find. That is all. Um, but at some point in the future, it's just my humble, humble opinion that that capital will be flowing smoothly around the world. And it's the only way you have to have this distributed ledger, um, this, this DLT based new financial system where there's no limitations, there's no one in charge of it really, and that capital just flows. It keeps it, what did they say a long time ago? It keeps it fair across the board. It levels the playing field. That's what they used to say. It levels the playing field. I think that makes perfect sense. So now, let's move on here because I thought this was interesting. Now, this article is from Cointelegraph.com. I'm going to call it Stellar Related News in my humble opinion because Stellar should jump on top of this. I'm pretty sure they already have. If you remember, there was a time when uh, Danelle Dixon was on a, a governmental panel and one of the senators at the end of that meeting, remember that? It was on video, right? That video should still be out there. I don't know why it would be removed. If it was, that's suspicious. But at the end of that, uh, that panel, there was a senator that said, I'd like to know more about Stellar. Said it directly to Danelle Dixon. You remember that? That senator was from where? If I remember correctly, that senator, or I think it was a senator, was from, that whoever that politician was, was from Texas. This article is titled, Texas lawmakers propose a gold-backed state digital currency. Digital, they didn't say electronic. 
That's legacy system stuff. Electronic, you think electronic, think Zelle, think Cash App, electronic. That functions differently. They said digital. That means distributed ledger technology. You putting it all together? Now, if that politician that was from Texas said they wanted to speak to Donnell Dixon some more, do you think that didn't happen? One of our people sent me some kind of information on a bank. It was a bank or something like that. And it, it was, the bank was named Stella or Stellar or something like that. I don't know. I don't know that there's any connection. I'm just saying there's some interesting things happening in Texas. So I'm just putting all these thoughts together. I'm just playing with thoughts. That's all, right? Let me read this little tidbit here. It says the bills state that the trustee must hold a sufficient amount of gold in reserve for all units of digital currency that have been issued and are still in circulation. Two Texas lawmakers have introduced identical bills for creating a state-based digital currency backed by gold, a move that comes despite objections from several United States lawmakers against introducing a central bank digital currency. Senator Brian Hughes, so now we have names, introduced Senate Bill 2334 on March 10th with Representative Mark Durazio introducing House Bill 4903 on the same day. So now we have stuff that we can look up. Stating that a fractional equivalent amount of physical gold would, would back the proposed digital currency. What are they going to run the digital currency across? Let's keep our eyes open, folks. Things are getting interesting fast, fast. You see how Algorand dominated in Florida? And what did Florida do? The politicians in Florida, let it be known, they liked Algorand before Algorand started dominating. And then Algorand sort of got the keys to the state. They've been dominating in Florida ever since. Now I'm making I'm drawing a, a, a equivalent here. The politician in Texas was interested in Stellar. So what's to say with regulatory clarity, Stellar can't dominate, or someone building on Stellar? I mean, like I said, I'm just putting things together here. There's no guarantee, but this is interesting, is it not? All right, let's scroll down here, read a little bit more. The bill explains that once a person purchases a certain amount of digital currency, the comptroller would use that money received to buy an equivalent amount of gold. The purchaser would then receive digital currency equal to that amount of gold that comptroller purchases with the with the money received from the purchaser. The value of a unit of digital currency must be equal to the value of the appropriate fraction of a troy ounce of gold at the time of transaction. So and this is it's going to be interesting to see if. Um, any other states follow suit. I mean, you do have some areas where they, they, they actually can issue you. Uh, there's like a gold dollar. I can't remember what it's called. It's very interesting though. I like it. It's, it's, it's a, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's, it's currency that's in, it's, it's gold currency, not coins. It's, it's like a, a, a paper, but it's, there's like gold interlaced in it. And those states have made it legit. You can buy it. You can buy it and pay at different stores with that gold currency. I'm sorry. It's, it's hard to explain, but if you look it up, you'll see. I, I'm not sure if they have it on AppMex or some of these gold websites. I think that they do. But you can't use it everywhere yet because not, not everywhere accepts that. But that's very interesting. A lot of these states are moving to gold, They're moving back to gold, right? Um... So this is something I'm going to keep my eyes on. And if Stellar is not, um, you know, discussing a lot of what Texas is doing, being rolled out across Stellar, I think that they definitely should reach out since Texas showed interest. But I'm quite sure they've had discussions already. I don't think that that senator left and didn't actually contact or have a further conversation with Dell Dixon after he already let it be known on camera that, that he wanted to do so. So I'm going to just leave that there. All right. But it's something to keep in mind. Uh, could you could you imagine? Uh, so now let's move on to a little bit of Algorand news here. It's from Algorand Foundation says update due to an overwhelming response to the 7220 drop by Lil Durk. They should have known that <sighs> I don't keep up with rap too much lately. I'm, I, I do listen to hip hop, but it's old school. But I do know one thing. Um, Lil Durk was at one time, I think maybe a year or two ago, the most popular hip hop, hip hop artist on earth. So there's a ton of fans that are going to flood through and try to buy things. So yes, 
Uh, it's going to bring a lot of traffic. You may have to push things back. They should have known that the traffic was going to be overwhelming. People want that. Not only that, they want it because, uh, you know, sooner or later, they'll probably sell it for a good profit. So they want to get in there first. Uh, so there, so this is great traffic for Algram. This is great advertising for Algram. And in the future, it's going to be great value flowing across Algram. Listen, if you have Lil Durk involved here, right, I'm sure in the future, it's not far-fetched to have people that's associated with Lil Durk uh, also, you know, releasing things possibly on Algorand. So you have, like, Lil Durk is connected with a lot of people. Lil Durk, Chief Keef, all of these very popular uh rappers these days right and their fans buy whatever it is that they're pushing so this could be very good all right so now let's move here we have a little xdc news a little zenfin news here zenfin released a tweet and it says this the future of blockchain is about interoperability we keep hearing that we've been hearing it for a long time but we see in correlation with them still pushing interoperability and shining in that aspect, we see the scramble of the central banks who, even though they've done all of this testing, they still lack interoperability. That's key. We have the advantage, everyone. We're, they're right where we want them. It says here, the future of blockchain is about interoperability and the at Rocket X exchange integration with Zenfin official XDC network is a step forward in achieving that vision so xdc becomes a little bit more powerful it grows a little bit more it continues to do an amazing job um and it already has so many powerful partnerships you know so i expect big things out of xdc uh in the future and this is just one more good step forward uh upon reaching the mountaintop in my humble opinion so now a little bit more Algorand news. Now, I have been waiting for an update on MaPay or MaPay, however you pronounce this. It's the medical one, one of, because there's three of them. I believe there's three. This is one of the medical offerings on Algorand. And I think they're going to be very key in the future. Anyway, there was an update and I just didn't catch it. Uh, so this is, is uh, from Yahoo Finance. It's titled MaPay bolsters delivery of blockchain healthcare payments and data internationally with new chief global strategy officer. OK, so they're growing the global healthcare fintech company revolutionizing healthcare payments and data exchange with distributed ledger and blockchain technology announced the appointment of Robert Metz as the firm's uh, new chief global strategy officer. Mets will assist MaPay team with the global origination and partnership opportunities, along with providing strategic counsel for implementation of MaPay solutions internationally. Mr. Metz is a pioneer in the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries with more than 20 years of executive level experience building successful domestic and international startups from the ground up to operational excellence. Remember, MaPay had gone over to India. Right. There's a lot happening in India right now. Um, so we'll look for some information on that coming out as well. Reporting directly to Michael Dersham, the founder and CEO of MaPay, Metz will be responsible for sourcing and evaluating international deal flow, as well as advancing the global strategy to provide more countries and organizations with MaPay's patented blockchain health solutions that transform medical payments and data for entire countries and this is on Algorand. How much more grandiose can you be? Algorand is dominating in every possible way. It's looking good, just my humble opinion. All right, so now let's move on here, all right? We're going to close out with a little bit of gold news, right? This is from gold.org. Let's go over the highlights here. It's actually it's titled Gold ETFs, Holdings and Flows. OK, highlights. March saw gold ETFs net inflows of one point nine billion dollars for the first time in 10 months. But this was not enough to prevent the net quarterly outflows of one point five billion. Uh, next bullet point. European funds led inflows in March. 
of 927 million US. However, on a quarterly basis, Europe, it says minus US, 2.4 billion also accounted for the bulk of, oh, the bulk of global outflows. Wow, I didn't realize that. In Q1, North America, 829 million plus US and other regions, uh, it says plus US, 124 million saw net inflows while Asia minus US 46 MN experienced mild outflows. It says March Q1 highlights lower yields, a weaker dollar. I hope I, I said all that data correctly. My apologies if I did not. Lower yields, a weaker dollar and a safe haven and safe haven buying lifted gold price in March by 9%. Fueled by the, the recent banking industry crisis, this was a key co uh, contributor to net inflows into physically backed gold ETFs during March as investors flocked to gold in bulk after March 12th following the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Global gold ETFs led by European funds saw US 1.9 billion net outflows in March, putting a stop to their nine month losing streak. Regional highlights. The majority of Q1 outflows came from European gold ETFs. While Asia saw mild outflows, North America and other region witnessed inflows during the first quarter of 2023. So we're going to leave off right there. Once again, that's from gold.org. They're doing a great job over there. So make sure you check them out. So now that you have that information, what are you going to do with it? I know what I'm going to do with it. So until next time, let's get to the money.